to welcome everyone to this second session of Window and Judaism. As I said, there's folks here in the sanctuary. There's also uh, my friends, my Zoomies out there. Um, for the folks who are on Zoom, I can see a few of you, but not everybody. So if you have a question, feel free to say, hey, Rabbi, because I'm for you. Um, or if you use the chat and say, hey, Rabbi, but you'll see there's Rabbi on the Bema. That's my computer. And then there's unattended tech station. That's the computer back there. So if you send the message to unattended tech station, no one's back there to see it. So make sure you message either everyone or Rabbi on the Bema. That's the only way I'm going to know if you are using chat to get my attention. So welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to start with me walking to the back to the unattended tech station to make the PowerPoint active. Because this is the adventure of technical stuff. As we started with the last time, here is the blessing for study. And um, we were having a conversation about prayer. And this is part of Judaism, that study, the world stands on three things. Study, ritual, and acts of loving kindness. Study is a spiritual experience. When two people sit to, to discuss the Torah, the divine presence rests between them. And so this is the blessing that, that we say before we do an act of study. And in fact, I will also tell you there's a whole ritual you can use to dedicate an act of study in Torah. So um, the blessing is very simple. Baruch HaTad and I. Hello, Hello, Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign in the universe, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage, la'asok, to soak in words of Torah. So last week I introduced you to a concept of ritual, text, and artifact. Ritual is the action, text is the story, and artifact is the, is the object, the physical object. And that in Judaism, and I think it happens a lot in all religions, that you have an interplay between those three parts that brings forward that experience. Okay? Last week, we, the, we were dealing with the artifact of the challah, and we talked about some of the rituals around them and some of the stories around them, and use that as a way of talking about Jewish values. And tonight, we're going to do the same thing, except ritual, text, and artifact. Um, the artifact, I'm going to start with the artifact, is the Seder plate. Okay? Um, you might see, if you have been to a Seder, you might see all kinds of different forms of this. Um, this is actually belongs to Estelle Canarac, Paul Canarac's mom. When she passed away, Paul passed it on to us, um, and I've been able to use it. You'll see on this Seder plate, there are all sorts of little dimples on it, and that it has shelves. So I will talk more about this, but this is the receptacle. This holds all of the ritual pieces that are part of a Passover Seder. Now that word Seder is an interesting one. Seder is related to Sidor. We were talking prayer books earlier. A prayer book, a Sidor, is called a, a prayer book is called a Sidor order because we do the prayers in a particular order, depending on what day of the week and what week of the year it is. So in other words, on the weekday evening, there's a particular order for the prayer, and on the weekday morning, there's a particular order for the prayer, and the same thing comes to the shop, on weekday afternoons, there's a particular order to the prayers. On Shabbat, on the Sabbath, there's a different order to the prayers. And on holidays, there's a different. That is the Siddur, you follow it because you Go in order. And when I say order, and part of the reasoning behind this, and I mentioned this, oh, it was Beer and Bible last week when I mentioned this, um, you will see that a lot of the rabbis, that a lot of the teachers and sages of Jewish life, like Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzhak in the 10th century, and Rambam, Rabbi Moses ben Maimonides in the 13th, 14th century, they were because, and we what part of the reasoning with, with physicians, because there is order out there, and they want to 
want to get their physical body in sync with the word out there. The other thing that you'll see is that rabbis were also astronomers. Know a lot. Right now it's a full moon. We're in the 15th day of the first month of the dawn, in the year 5782. That means it's a full moon. We're watching the moon cycle. We watch the solar cycle. We know there's order out there. And the rabbis say, if there's order out there, how do we get our lives as we move through the world in sync with the order out there? Okay. So the root, Samech Resh, has to do with order. We have a lot of sense of we've got to do things in a particular order. The Passover Seder is the Passover order that we do this crazy ritual in. Okay? The okay. crazy ritual because in, unlike the Sidor, or the order that is out there, the Seder was done for a very particular reason. If you're doing things in a particular order, why do you do them in a particular order? I just demonstrated why you do them in a particular order. What am I asking you to do? To answer a question. You do the Seder in a particular order so that your kids say, what are we doing? And then you can say, aha, have I got a story for you? You will see that being repeated over and over again, that um, part of the Seder is to get the kids, and by that I mean any human being of any age that has kid-like tendencies, to ask the question of, wait, what are we doing? And the even more important question of Passover, what is the most important question of Passover? When do we eat? Thank you. <laughs> when do we eat? Oh, we got to go through this entire order of the service, right? So um, when we talk about order, sometimes it's a, the rabbis creating an order, but for a whole other reason. That's what the Seder is. When we talk about the meal, that's the afterthought. The Seder is all of the stuff leading up to it to whet your appetite, to tune you into values, to tell you the story. And the last is these that are here. I'm going to hold up. This is the one I used for childhood. This is called a Haggadah. A Haggadah, Haggadah, means storybook. This is the book that has the Seder in it, but as you go through this Seder, what are you doing? Telling the story of Passover, showing all of its value, reliving that moment as if we ourselves came out of Egypt. What did it mean for our people to go from bondage and degradation in Egypt to freedom and redemption through the, through the hands of God? Okay? So this is the story. This is the ritual. Sorry, this would be the artifact. That was a test. You all knew that was the artifact. Um, and the Seder, you know, the, the ritual that we do, the Seder, that's the ritual. Okay? Now, I'm also going to see if you see there's another um, question that's up there. Hold on, I'm down goes. Got it. Okay. Yes. Are you all able to hear me now? That's better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move the microphone a little bit. Is that better? That's better. Okay. If you can't hear me, just say it. That's a lot better. Okay. So we have a question in the audience, and I absolutely. Uh, okay. So, yes, if you want to. Oh, so I'm, we're doing this like Shabbat for you all on Zoom. Um, what you want to do is go to a speaker view. I'm going to be small because I also have the projection up, um, and I have to be able to read what I'm seeing on the projection. So that's why I've got that the set up that we do. Um, what was the oh question? Yeah. When you sit down for the Seder meal, is the story told by the youngest child, or is that just the best way of looking through the rest of it? We're go we're gonna we'll we'll get there. Yes. So the question was, does the youngest child tell the story? And I said, we'll get there. You have to go in order. Yes. You said that the Seder is a ritual. Is the Haggadah the text 
Torah? No. So this is the this. So the question is: Is the Haggadah a Torah? No. This is the Haggadah. You're welcome to, to look at this. It's it's an activity book, <laughs> quite literally. Um, I mean, it, it it is an act. You're going to see it's an activity book that it goes through all of the stuff on the seder plate. It goes through all of the different rituals. It is this whole incredible play that an act, set of activities that you do over the course before you even get to the meal. Okay. Um, I'm also going to would like to to highlight that there's also the issue of what the book says versus what your family does. And that is a huge thing that happens in Judaism. There's, if you look up, you can find instructions of this is what you do in a Seder, this is how you're supposed to do it, this is, and then you go to somebody's house and they do what their parrot did for them. In fact, in the cookbook that we use for our son learning with Jewish food, um, it even said, it even has a chapter of what happens when you leave, you have to leave your first Seder, that that becomes an adult rite of passage when you host your first Seder. When you stop going to your mother's house and you have to learn how to make the brisket yourself and the matzo balls yourself and the soup yourself, um, that is a whole rite of passage um, that you take on. In fact, when that happened with when Jill and I, the first year we were dating, my parents came to us, we made the soup, and they wondered why all those vegetables were floating in it. Um, Jill and I loved it. So you, you have the, this is what the book says, and when then you, you have... Book, is that the book? No, I mean... This, 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 this is I mean, what the book, quote unquote, the, if you looked in instruction books that gave you the formal teaching of how Judaism is put together, they're going to say, this is the, like when they say we're going to throw the book at you. Um, it's kind of a metaphorical... That's the instruction of the orthodoxy of how you're supposed to do it. Okay? Torah is, this is, Torah is the, the sacred scripture, right? We're now talking about the, all of the tools that we use that help connect to it. That is just like one piece of it. Okay? Um, that is more like the prayer book for Passover. Okay? Um, so I mentioned that there were 14 steps. You'll notice I'm singing because music is a way of memory, right? So you get those melodies in mind. So you have Kadesh, where it's the first cup of wine, or Chatz, there's hand washing, or Chatz, you're dipping greens, Yachatz, you're breaking matzah, Magi, that's when we tell the story, Rokhat, you wash your hands again, but with a blessing. Motsi matzah, so we actually say a blessing for eating of bread. Maror, we eat the bitter herbs. Akorech, which is matzah with the bitter herbs. Shulchan orech, finally, step 10, you eat. <clears throat> Safun is the time of the afakum, and we'll talk about that. Varech, that's when you um, say birkat hamazon, grace after the meal. Hallel, which is an act of praise, and then Yitzah is when you finish. There are 14, you follow them step by step, stage by stage, okay? Um, this is a Seder plate with stuff on it. So, you would, you see that you have stuff up here. I don't know which, which side are people look. everybody look over to this one. Um, so you have Zoroa, which is the shank bone, okay? usually a lamb bone that's been roasted. You have a beitza, an egg. You have the bitter herbs, or maror. You have the haroset, which is a fruit compote. We'll talk about that. Chazeret, which is here, is lettuce. And karpas, which is here, is parsley or sweet herbs. Okay? Um, so this is kind of that horizontal um, level of the Seder plate, okay? So each of these things, and you'd see from, from Seder to plate to Seder plate, you'd see all of those things, okay? Each one of them is part of, part and parcel of 
the story. Okay? So if why are there bitter herbs on the plate? There are bitter herbs because slavery was bitter. Why is there a shank bone, a lamb's a bone, a, a um, roasted bone from a lamb? To remind us of the Passover sacrifice that when the people of Israel were getting ready to come out of Egypt, they sacrificed a lamb, put the blood on the doorposts to say this is an Israelite house, and so that the angel of death passed over. Why is there an egg? Trick question. Parsley. Why is there carpas? Why are there sweet herbs on the, on the, the Seder plate? What season is this? This spring. is in the season of spring. You, that even says in Torah, this is when you do this in the season of spring. That's why we have the crazy calendar that we have, because it says you got to have Passover in the spring. When I was a student rabbi, I feel like that should be like, when I was a student rabbi. <laughs> yeah, it was 25 years ago. You get those numbers, it gets scary. I was a student rabbi in Billings, Montana. Now, have any of you been to Montana before? Have you been to Billings? Have you been yeah. to Montana? It's cold. I had gone to the University of Florida. It doesn't snow at the University of Florida. There I am, leading a Passover Seder, talking about the rebirth of spring, and there's a foot of snow on the ground. And it was just like, this is so so strange. It was very beautiful, but it was really strange. Um, I will throw in some of my favorite um, Seder stories as we go along. Um, but Karpas, the sweet herbs, are a reminder of spring. Chazeret, lettuce. Some Seder plates have it, other Seder plates don't, because there's all sorts of d debate and discussion of what Chazeret actually is and why it's there. Um, and then finally, Chorosit. What is choroset? Yeah. It is an apple compote that's supposed to be sticky to remind yeah. us of the mortar of the people of Israel making the bricks for Pharaoh's cities. So you see, if we go horizontally around the Seder plate, that you've got reminders of slavery, you've got reminders of labor, you have reminders of freedom, all of these different little pieces, right? And there also might be even a... Um, a, a place to put salt water. Why would you need salt water? Tears. Remind us of the tears. And what's next to the Seder plate would be a Kiddush cup, right? Because there are four acts of drinking wine as a reminder of the four ways. Wait, what was that? Salt hey, water. Rabbi. Hmm? Uh, well, ah. Don't Not forget the orange. That's exactly I, what I was going to say to you. Nancy, Nancy Smith. <laughs> there is no orange on this Seder plate that you have to wait because I'll get there. And if, Rabbi, do you remember that we did that every year? We put them all together, especially with the orange on there, put them to all the everything will, in there? Yes. I will. Do not worry. I haven't forgotten the orange, but the orange isn't yet on the Seder plate. Have no fear. What? So oh, stop. Okay. We're getting so, disorderly. Yes, yes, you are. That's okay. When you um, over the egg, it means yes. Would that be reversed? Um, yes, but there's a whole different issue which I will, I'll come to. You have to be patient on the egg. Like you have to be patient to eat. Okay. The line of Judaism, and in fact, there's even books that are, are, there's a film by this name, When Do We Eat? Okay? Because that is the most important part about Passover, holding off the hungry hordes for as long as you can to tell them about the suffering of the people. Okay. Um, I'm only somewhat kidding. Um, okay. How many cups of wine are there? Four. Four, but they're, they're five. Five? Four. Five. There are four cups we drink, but there's five cups of wine. The fifth cup is for Elijah. Elijah the prophet. There Elijah. Is a discussion 
in the place where they pulled the um, statement that there are four statements of redemption in Exodus, there's some discussion of if there's a fifth. And so what they did, they wanted four children and four questions and four cups of wine, but there might have been a fifth. So what the rabbis do is they come up, they have the cup of Elijah that allows you to have five cups of wine, but four are drunk, and the fifth one is Elijah. And maybe Elijah will show up, Elijah the prophet, taken into heaven on a, on a um, chariot, and he's going to be the one that's the herald of the Messiah. Wouldn't Passover be a great time for Elijah to show up? And it's just one of those playful, powerful parts of, of Passover to keep you on your toes, like the egg. Okay, So yes, the egg is a symbol of rebirth, but there's no mention of it actually in the Haggadah other than on the Seder plate. We'll get to it. Okay, that's the horizontal. That's all of these symbols that are on Seder plates. That's all the symbols. No more symbols. <laughs> about 20 minutes. That's the one that you always have. <laughs> what, was, uh, what was that, Linda? I said this, that's the one that we always have next to you, next to you. Yes, this is the Seder plate that I always have. Okay, so the vertical in this, uh, and this one's nice. I lo love this one because it's got the um, matzah wrap integrated into the Seder plate. But you'll see on top, top of the Seder plate, and you have three stacks, <laughs> three shelves. The three shelves are for, uh, are for pieces of matzah. Okay? And here, you're going to get three descriptions of why there are three levels. And um, this is, in, uh, is on your handout page, but you're going to see it up here. Um, there are three pieces of matzah stacked on the table. Um, the matzah is for the usual blessing over the bread, the mozi. The bottom matzah, so the top one is for mozi. The bottom one is for kor korach, which is made with matzah maror and karoset. The middle one is for breaking. And that is a reminder of the people who don't have enough food to eat. And for the afakomen, which I'll talk about in just a minute, the matzo, three matzos, are symbolic of three castes of Jews. That you have the Kohanim, the priests, the Levites, who are the helper of the Kohanim, and the Israelites, which are, these are, those are ancient distinctions, which have for the most part disappeared in Judaism. On three level, on a practical level, three matzos are needed so that when we break the middle matzah, we still have two whole ones. Because remember, we learned last week that you have the two that you have two for the the loaves of the of, for the sacrifice, um, and so you need so you'll still have two. You need three so that you have two for the um, for mozi. We eat in memory of the quick flight of our ancestors um, from Egypt. Slaves, when the word of freedom came, they took the dough they had and ran out before it had a chance to rise. Um, and I will even tell you, I actually made sourdough bread earlier this evening. If anybody would like sourdough culture, I am happy to share. Um, it's one of those things, it's a gift that keeps on giving. And if anybody would like to learn how to make sourdough bread, I'm happy to demonstrate what I do. Um, I share that with you for an important reason. What is sourdough culture? What, what is what? What is a sourdough culture? A sourdough. What's it made of? Water and a, flour. It's, it, it's flat. No, it's flour and water and yeast. It's in a bubbling live state. Oh, oh, a sourdough. Okay. A sourdough culture, a sourdough starter, is flour and water and yeasts bubbling in a happy brew. Before the Fleischmann brothers, nice Jewish boys, figured out the whole freeze-dried packets of yeast, if you wanted to leaven something, if you wanted to make bread or anything rise, you had to use a sourdough culture. That's not new. That's actually rather ancient. In fact, they found um, in Egypt, broken Egyptian pottery, they looked into the pores, and they found live yeasts from 4,000 years ago that they were able to get sourdough culture started again with. Um, what matzah is and why we don't eat leaven is if you take sourdough culture and you put it in the sun, what's going to happen to it? You put it in the sun? It takes a long time to rise, but if I take a container of sourdough starter 
and I put it out in the sun, what's going to happen to it? The yeast is going to die, it'll dry out, and then it'll turn into a piece of bread. That's what matza is. It isn't that their yeast that you know they had to leave, so they didn't have an hour or two to rot, let it rise. It's if you have sourdough culture, or if you've got bread started, it takes. I started it tonight, my sourdough bread. It'll it takes all night to rise, and so if they left and you're on the move and you're out in the heat, it will turn into just a flat piece of bread. Okay. We've actually done that by accident in our house once. Um, the good news is I had plenty of other starters. So when we talk about, for Passover, taking the chametz, the leavening out, what we're really saying is acknowledging not using that starter for a week, and there's all sorts of other stuff in, in that, that discussion. That one I'll have to have a little bit closer to Passover. I also, yeah. Correct. It has, it's not just that it hasn't, it doesn't rise, it doesn't have any leavening agent in it. Okay? When my mother made sourdough bread, <laughs> she made it with buttermilk. I mean, I don't so know. So that's, that's a different way of doing, so, so she's adding a souring agent as opposed to what I'm doing, which is using natural yeast to make it rise. Two very, two different, Maybe. it's like having pickles with vinegar as opposed to having pickles that ferment. Okay. Um, okay. Matzah, the middle matzah. Again, we're talking about this as an artifact, as a physical object. And so you have to think about the adults are sitting at the table. They're having very serious discussions. Okay? Have you ever sat at the table while your parents are talking and been bored? <laughs> and take a, your phone out and done your own thing because you just didn't want to bother. Now, what if your father had taken out a dollar and said, if you watch this dollar and keep track of this dollar while we're having the conversation, you can keep the dollar. Would you put the phone away? Okay? That's the Afakoman. The Afakoman is this amazing magic trick that if I take a piece of matzah, and I hide it from my kids and tell them, if you stay here at the table paying attention, you can go and get a reward. That's what the afakoman was. It was a sweet reward if you stayed and listened to the entire story. Okay? We also have other things like, uh, no, we'll come to that in just a second. Um, reminder of the central theme, this middle, another issue with the beef matzot. Um, central theme of Passover, brokenness with the hope of redemption, right? That if you break the middle matha, it's okay. We'll find ways of creating harmony again. Um, and also that it's a reminder of their departure from Egypt. We see all of these different reasons for three levels of matha, and different people tune in to different ones. Um, the other thing I'm going to tell you as I'm explaining all of this to you, remember I mentioned there's the book, and then there's what your family does. Very often, people go and watch what their families do, and no one explains anything. I have often had done teachings where people are like, I didn't know that. I had never learned that before. It's a huge challenge in Judaism. I remember being in rabbinical school and learning about the Seder. I, and I grew up in a house with a rabbi as a father. I didn't know any of this. I knew a lot about Passover. I knew a lot about the Seder, but I didn't know some of that book stuff that adds extra layers of meaning and story and connection that is so incredible and powerful. Okay, now, you were asking me, where's the Torah fit into all of this? The Torah is the beginning. It's a seed, okay? And part of Judaism preserves, there's a lot of preservation of the stuff from the very beginning, and then there's a evolution that happens too. As we find ourselves in different places, as we find ourselves in different circumstances, the ways we approach these rituals, the ritual objects, a lot of this stuff changes. Okay? So I'm going to show you how it both preserves and it evolves. So first of all, um, we have what was originally done in, that we get in the Torah. 
we're going to get what was done. And um, if you're looking on the handout, um, we're actually on to we're on page two. Um, but it's all going to be up here. Um, what was done after the destruction of the temple, right? So you've got what was done in Egypt, what was done in the temple, what was done after the destruction of the temple, and then what we do. And there's multiple layers in between. Okay? Because you could also say, my family is Ashkenazic. Ashkenaz is Germany. My family, so there's a whole community of Israel. Israel when people departed from the land of Israel in various diasporas. One chunk ended up in Germany, Ashkenaz. They then spread to the east and west throughout northern Christian Europe. Those were the Ashkenazi. They spoke Yiddish as well as other languages, but Yiddish was part of that. And that developed a culture based on what it was like to live in East, Central and Eastern Europe. The other main group of Jews are called Sephardim. Sephardim, Sparad, is Spain. They, they, that community came out of the Muslim world that was in Spain, like in the Golden Age of Spain, and spread throughout the Mediterranean basin. And that's another kind of cultural part of Judaism. And Ashkenazim do some things, certain things some ways, and Sephardim do the same thing in a different way. I have actually seen this as a yarmulke, right? There is no basis in Jewish law for covering your head. There's custom for covering your head, but there is no basis. The ritual object that is in Jewish law, of course, are the tzitzit, the, the, um, the fringes on the corner of the garment. I've actually seen text, I'd have to find out where, but I have seen text from one place that said, I couldn't imagine going into a synagogue with my head uncovered in my shoe, in my, and shoes on my feet. Yeah, shoes on my feet and my head uncovered, and vice versa. That depending on where you were, some people put on a hat and put on their shoes, and uh, no, sorry, they took off their hat and put on their shoes in, in Germany, in Eastern Europe. That was, there was a period of time where, they, where you didn't have your head covered for prayer, but you did wear your shoes. In the Muslim world, how do you go into a house of worship? Take your shoes Take off. Take your shoes off. And so you'll see those kinds of differences in some of the different, in the, we all call it haroset. Ashkenazic haroset has apples and walnuts and, um, and, and, and red wine in it. Sephardic has all kinds mm -hmm. of different dried fruits and apricots and and um, figs and all sorts of other stuff, okay? And there's also differences in what um, people eat or don't eat, okay? So in Exodus, this is the beginning of Passover. This is the Passover story. You shall keep watch over it until the 14th day of the month. Um, this is the lamb. And, uh, and all the assembled uh, congregation of Israelites shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night. They shall roast it over a fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. No mention of, of unleavened bread because they're running out of Egypt. Here it's because it's part of the uh, sacrificial um, culture. Don't, but here you get, how do you eat it? With? Unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or cooked in any way with water, but roast it, head, tail, head, legs, and entrails over the fire. Don't leave any of it until morning. Any of it is left until morning, you should burn it. Eat it with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and eat it vertically. Okay? Which is interesting because we say to recline, but we'll get to that. Okay? Um, and when, so here you're seeing some of the stuff I'm talking, right? We've got bitter herbs, you've got um, uh, Passover offering, which we'll talk about. Um, you've got the unleavened bread, you have the way of cooking it and eating it and interacting with it. And when you enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, as God promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this right? You shall say, 
It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord because God passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when God smote the Egyptians but saved our houses. What I told you at the beginning, which is all, the whole point of the Seder, is to be able to have the kids say, why are you doing this? And then you get to tell them the story. That's Torah. That's how long that and how deep that whole concept of doing things to catch people's attention, to get them to ask so we can tell the story to our kids, is embedded in the Torah in the Exodus experience. It is really incredible that it is that powerful and that deep. So this is from the Mishnah, okay? So there are descriptions of the Passover rituals as they would have been done in the tabernacle in the temple. Um, but when the temple is destroyed, you can't do the Passover sacrifice anymore. Right? The Passover sacrifice is, was a, the big element of the Passover gatherings that would have happened in Jerusalem when they all went up to the pilgrimage festival. If the temple is destroyed, you can't do the Passover sacrifice. And so what do you do in order to observe Passover? And the Seder, this Seder, is what develops as a way of saying, if we're, we know we're going to meet at that time, and we know we're going to do rituals, how do we have it without the sacrifice? Okay? Um, this text is from around 200 of the Christian era, so about 130 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. Um, and the Mishnah is beautiful because there's some debate. Does it say how to live Judaism without a temple, or how to live Judaism when you have a third temple? And there's all sorts of scholarly debate. Yes? i got to back up the bus a little bit. Okay. Because there were two different uh, traditions that maybe one was the Ashkenazi. Well, that's actually later. Okay. And then, is there a difference in the way it's celebrated between the Hasidic and the Orthodox or the Reformed? Um, yes and no. So those are different distinctions. Um, so yes, and an Orthodox, and depending on which group of Orthodox, might do things in a little bit of a different way. And then what a family, a Reformed Jewish family might do is different than what a um, Israeli family might do. And then you have the reform, uh, Reformed Ashkenazi. There are all sorts of different ways, but it's also remarkable how much is similar um, from, from family to family and Haggadah to Haggadah. Okay? Um, so, it, and that's a great question. No, not... Everybody does it, for the most part, in the same order, but some people skip more steps. Other people spend more time in different parts of the story. They all seem to manage to consume four cups of wine. They <laughs> all end up in the same place. Well, I do that. Okay, so this is from 2,000 years ago. This is what I'm about to share with you now. Um, and that, to me, is kind of extraordinary how old this really is. The attendants brought vegetables before the leader of the Seder prior to the meal, if there were no other vegetables on the table. Okay? What do you call when you sit at, at, in a restaurant and a person brings you vegetables? What do you call that? Salad. A salad. <laughs> what do you put on the salad? Dressing. He dips the chazeret into water or vinegar to taste some food before he reaches for the dessert of the bread and the bitter herbs and all of that. What I'm describing to you is a, um, oh, I'm going to blink on the word of it. Oh, a Roman symposium meal that if you look, remember, these are folks living in the Roman world. And so they said, this is what Romans, three Romans do. And so we're going to base our Seder on that kind of meal, because that's their schema, their paradigm of understanding. You're going to have a lavish meal. This is what it's going to look like. And what's incredible is how many of those different elements are actually part and parcel of what we still do in the Seder today. I will add this as a note. When I was growing up, the first part, the first thing you get to eat is you get to take parsley, sweet herbs, and dip it in the salt water, right? The, bitter, the sweet herbs are spring. And the salt water is the tears, and you're balancing your tears with your sweetness and joy and all of that. Lovely, right? 
doesn't taste really good. So I've always advocated, if that's the salad course, bring us some salad, it's okay. And there you have it in the Mishnah. Okay, um, they brought before him matzah and chazeret and charoset. Okay, so this is parts of the meal. So they bring him bread and they bring him more vegetables and they bring him the fruit compote and at least two cooked dishes in honor of the festival. That we think, that second cooked dish, we think is the egg. That the egg is a reminder of one of those cooked dishes. Um, but there's no mention of the egg. It's on the Seder plate, but nothing in the Haggadah that even describes the egg, which is kind of interesting. Atana, a teacher, comments that this was the practice. Although eating karoset is not a mitzvah, it's merely custom. Okay? Um, karoset is potentially a, a stand, well, we'll get to the Hillel sandwich. It's a stand-in for the, um, the, the um, Passover sacrifice, but we'll come to it when we get to the um, Hillel sandwich. Um, in the period of the temple stood, they offered the Paschal lamb. They brought before him the body of the Paschal lamb, right? So if there was, if during the time of the temple, you're doing a Passover offering, they would have brought that before him. If you're not, if the temple is destroyed, you're not doing sacrifices, you're not going to eat um, a sacrifice lamb. Um, they poured the cup, the leader, the son asks his father the questions about the differences between the Passover night and the regular night. And if the son does not have the intelligence to ask questions on his own, his father teaches him the questions. Okay? Um, why is this night different from all other nights? Those were some of the first pieces of the Seder I was taught, because the youngest child is supposed to ask. Here it is in his prayer book, in the Haggadah, in the Mishnah, 2000 years ago. That whole structure of asking questions or of setting up your kids to ask questions is that old. Remember I showed you in Exodus where it says when you get to the land, make sure your kids ask why, is the, what, why are we doing all of this stuff and you can tell them the story. Here it is in the Mishnah in the next set saying they might not ask, because kids, they're pretty precocious. Teach them the questions. Don't leave it to chance. Teach them, right? Here we have, on all other nights, we eat leavened bread or matzah. On this night, our bread is matzah. On all other nights, we eat vegetables. On this night, we eat bitter herbs. So far, we're hitting two, out two, two for two. That's the four questions. You'll see them in a minute. The Mishnah continues with the questions. When the temple was standing, one would ask, on all other nights, we eat roasted, stewed, or cooked meat. On this night, all the meat is roasted meat of the Paschal lamb. So interesting, we don't have that question anymore. And the final question was after the destruction of the temple. On all the other nights, we dip the vegetables only once. Tonight, we dip twice. Okay, this is text from the Mishnah. And then here are the four questions that we teach our kids. Why is this night different from all other nights? Why on this night do we eat only matzah? Um, why on this night do we specifically make sure we're eating bitter herb? Um, why on this night do we make sure we dip vegetables twice? And then why on this night do we sit up? Uh, on all other nights, you can either sit upright or you can lean back. Why on this night do we specifically make sure we recline? What? Can you still hear me? Yep. Oh, recline. Thank you, Myra. You're welcome. While she's sitting in a recliner. <laughs> um, so um, it's interesting that they took the question about the Passover sacrifice out and popped this one in. Again, we're talking 2,000 years ago. Um, and in part because they're, we're not going to talk about the, Pas the Passover sacrifice. Because that's kind of that part that we lost with the destruction of the temple. Okay? However, we do have the roll You do have the shank bone on the plate, on the Seder plate, that you have to point to and pick. But we don't eat from it. Now, this is one of my rabbinic moments. 
I was in, I'm pretty sure it was um, Marion, Ohio. It was either Columbus, Mississippi or Marion. I think it was my last pulpit in Marion, Ohio. Um, and I was talking about differences between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic, right? This is long after the Mishnah, long after the Talmud. This is the Middle Ages. Um, in Christianity, who's the Lamb of God? Jesus. And there is this awful thing called the blood libel in which Jews are accused of taking, using Christian blood in their matzah. Okay? And it was an excuse to have lots of xenophobia and violence and anti-Semitism against Jews. Okay? Um, there are forms of the blood libel even to this day, and I would even tell you some of the anti-vax rhetoric has some of that feel to it. It's really scary stuff. Um, the Ashkenazim, living in a very Christian environment, realizing that that was going on, specifically stopped, cut down on the references to lamb in the Passover Seder. The Sephardim lived in a Muslim world. That wasn't an issue. It wasn't a problem in the same way. And so you'll actually, whereas Ashkenazim do not eat lamb on Passover, Sephardim do eat lamb on Passover. It's a different culture, a different um, uh, atmosphere that they're in. Okay? So I jokingly said that we should, and what I meant to say is, so next year, we, we live in a different world, we don't have to live in that kind of fear, so next year let's eat lamb chops for Passover. <laughs> Who wants to guess what I really said? Oh, gosh. I pork chops. <laughs> I said, so next year let's eat pork chops. And they all started looking at me like, did I just say pork chops? <laughs> <laughs> that was the only year that I led Passover Seder in, in <laughs> Good for um, you. <laughs> there for a year. It was just one of those moments. Um, and we still don't eat lamb chops in my house anyway um, uh, on Passover um, at all. Okay. Um, so, again, so that's one of those things. It depends on the pressures. Some of it's so here's a difference piece of it, right? What Ashkenazi karoset is apples and nuts and that kind of stuff. Why? Because that's what their ingredients were to make a fruit compote. Mm -hmm. The Sephardim are using dried apricots and figs and dates. Why? Because that's what they had. The Ashkenazim used horseradish. By the way, horseradish root is not a bitter herb. It's a spicy root. But if you live in the Pale of Settlement in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, and it's April, is there a lot of herbs around? No. So they used what they had to be able to make do to tell the story. And you will see that in all sorts of different ways. Okay? So that's a little bit about, you can see how it evolved and preserved. There is stuff we do to this day that is all the way back to Exodus 12. And there are places and ways that it, it is adjusting and changing depending on where we're living, depending on what the ingredients are around and who you're sitting with. Here's one of the really um, interesting um, layers. So you have karoset, which is the, um, the fruit compote. You have maror, the bitter herb, and you have the matzah. Okay? There was the practice during the time of the temple that you take matzah, the Passover sacrifice, and the bitter herb, and eat that together as, uh, um, as a sandwich kind of thing, okay? If you don't have the Paschal offering, if you don't have that lamb sacrifice, what did they do? They substituted the haroset, the fruit compote, to the sweet balancing the bitter. So Hillel the Elder, first century rabbi from whom our movement is named, because this is an article from Hillel from colleges, argued that elements of the Passover Seder, including maror, the bitter herbs, and haroset, should be placed in between two slices of matzah and eaten in a sandwich. When the temple stood, some Talmudic rabbis suggest Hillel even introduced Korban Pesach, the sacrificed lamb, into a sandwich too. The temple was destroyed, the lamb stopped being included, and that's a shame because lamb, horseradish, and apple chutney do sound pretty tasty. Okay? Um, Sometimes you'll get stuff to eat because it tastes really good, and other times you'll get stuff to eat because it doesn't taste very good, right? 
you actually take some of the malor, the bitter herb, and put it on the matzah and eat that as a way of, and wow, the horseradish is really good on the sinuses, um, as a way of tasting quite literally the bitterness. You eat it because it's not comfortable. Okay? Um, I love this Hillel sandwich. Yeah, go ahead. No, this is, no, it said Harosa, that was their interpretation, that was their modern anachronism of what Harosa would have been. We don't have any good apple recipes of Harosa from the time of Hillel. Yeah, I didn't say, and even if Horsa, that's the time No, it would have been Maror, it would have been bitter herbs, like a good, something like that. All innovations, Hillel same the Talmud, in Talmud Pesachim, records a debate. Whereas Hillel promoted eating of these elements in one go, other rabbis argued that each should be elements are separate and should be eaten separately. They all have their own blessing, part of the Seder. They carry very different, even contradictory symbolisms. Matzah represents our hurried escape from Egypt and the dryness of the desert. The bitter herbs of Maror remind us of the bitterness of e slavery in Egypt, and the froza with its mortar-like texture tells of the experience of slave bravery, but also the sweetness of redemption. Don't get these things confused. Hillel's opponent said, eat them separately. After all, as part of the Seder, we don't say a specific blessing for the sandwich because we already made blessings on each with its component parts. It's just necessary to add the extra step of also eating them together. And so there Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, Nancy? Now, I think there's probably a lot of other people who feel like I feel too. That is my favorite thing to eat. <laughs> the Passover is a Hillel sandwich. It's, it's so delicious, and it's and, so rewarding because you're actually eating something. Right, because you know at so. that point you're really close to the meal when you get to have the Hillel sandwich, because that's usually when they bring out the soup. Okay? <laughs> yeah, so what delicious. What saying is absolutely true and happens all the Again, there's, here you're seeing a debate, right? We saw the the slice debate last week. Here you're seeing that same kind of thing where we're sitting there and argue and discuss. Now, my guess is that you'd have one person sit there eating his Hillel sandwich, arguing that we shouldn't be eating a Hillel sandwich, with another guy eating his Hillel sandwich, arguing we should, because that tends to be how the arguments really happen. Um, but you can see there's, there, there are places where it's difference of opinion. Sometimes you actually get decisions, but a lot of times you just keep discussing the differences of opinions, even as you're doing this stuff. It's really pretty amazing. And there's some is Hillel saying, how do we capture what I think the ritual was in the temple, and other people are saying, here's how I'm trying to capture what I think the ritual was in the temple. Yeah. And here you. Everybody likes the Hillel sandwich. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of love for the Hillel sandwich because we still do it to this day. Okay? Rabbi? Rabbi? Yeah? Go ahead, Ellen. Um, so, but then, okay, then matzah gets eaten all through the week. Right. Okay. Why is it that we we eat it all week because it actually does say in the Torah for seven days you should eat matzah. Okay, so that's a Torah piece. Yes. Versus the Haggadah piece. Okay, so we're talking right now. I'm talking specifically about the ritual that is done on the first night of Passover to start it off. But there's other stuff that you do through the course of the of the week, seven or eight days, depending on how you want to count of of Passover including that you don't eat any leavened bread or any product that has been loved through the seven or eight days of Passover. And there are certain days that are holy days and certain things you're supposed to do, but it actually does say in Torah, don't, you don't eat leavened bread, leavened bread. Leavened products through the seven days of, uh, the seven days that, uh, of Passover. Did that answer your question, Ellen? Yeah, I just wanted to make the distinction between the Seder piece and the Torah piece. But they both have, they both involve the, mat, the unleavened bread. Right, but the Torah piece that I showed you is actually part of the origin of the Seder, but there's more stuff that then continues even after the Seder. Passover is mm -hmm. not done at the end of the Seder. Mm -hmm. Seven days. Okay. Two things that are not in the story that do appear on the Seder plate. One is the egg. And the other is Chazera. And you'll see references to 
the chazeret, some type of green, and it's very unclear why it is or why it's there, some, as kind of a supplementary of the tartas, and the other is the egg. It's on the Seder plate, but there's really no, and there, you're right, it's a spring renewal, um, and it's roasted, and so there's no real part of the story where, oh, and Moses was out for finding the burning bush and rescued an egg, for example. There's nothing in the story. There's no tie. Some of the thoughts are this the Chagiga, it's an extra festival offering. Um, others is the springtime and renewal. Um, there's a few different things, but it doesn't appear in any, everything else you're, you're seeing, even in references from 2,000 years ago. All of these different things are talked about. There you have the mystery of the egg, which honestly could be, we're going to put an egg on the Seder plate to see if anyone notices we don't talk about it. Okay. There's also the kids get hungry. So what do you give to kids? Give them an egg dinosh on. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yes. So interesting you should mention Easter eggs and, um, and Christ Christianity um, because everybody knows that chicken eggs come from rabbits. <laughs> I'm guessing that if I was with a, uh, I'm guessing Joe and I could have quite a discussion about the whole, how did the egg find its way into Easter? Um, and it's got some of the same issues in it. Part of it is these are springtime rituals. Spring is a time of rebirth. Um, and that's kind of where eggs come in. Um, and I think it's got some of the same complications. That's very good. Also, let's, I'm going to look at it from a very different lens. Okay, You don't have a lot of money. You don't have a lot of resources. And you're told you have to have two pieces of a main, two main courses. You have a meat and you have eggs. That's another completely different way of interpreting. Okay, some of you mentioned stuff on the Seder plate. Okay. You have the Torah. And then you have prophets and you have writings. That's the Hebrew Bible. After the Hebrew Bible, you have the Mishnah, which is the rabbi saying, how do we live out our Judaism? And then you have the Talmud. Do you know what the Talmud is? The Talmud is the next generation reading the Mishnah and saying, we need to explain a little bit more and argue over and discuss the Mishnah. And so that's a whole commentary on the Mishnah. That became the Talmud. And the Talmud, by the way, is commentary on top of commentary on top of commentary. Until you have went from six orders of the Mishnah to volumes of Talmud. And no one's going to read, not everybody is going to read. You need an answer to a question. When you need an answer to a question, what do you do now? Google. You Google it. Humanity <laughs> said, no one wants to read the whole Talmud. I'm going to be your search engine for you. And he wrote the Mishnah Torah, which is his way of saying, I'm going to go through the, all of the Talmud, and I'm going to digest it down for you. Do you know what happened as soon as he digested it? Any guesses? People started making comments, and it started to evolve and grow and grow and grow. And so what happens? It gets too big, and then somebody else came and digested. And that's part of what happens in Judaism is stuff expands and contracts and expands and contracts. Okay? That's what, why there are all of these different Haggadot that we have because different communities, different people felt licensed in really amazing and powerful ways to say, here's the ritual. I'm going to embellish it or I'm going to add to it or I'm going to put my spin on it my <laughs> values until you get all of these different ones. And it gets longer and longer and longer. And then you say, I can only sit for an hour. My tushy gets sore. My, I get hungry. The kids are all fetching. Get some food on the table already. And then you digest it. Bring it make it smaller and smaller because you've got to have it family friendly, right? Because the whole point is the kids. And then somebody says, well, how can you throw out that? And have you considered that? And then it gets longer. Expand and contract. Expand and contract. That's just part of the flow of the way Jews approach um, ritual and text and artifact. So 
Sometimes it's the artifact that expands, sometimes it's the ritual, sometimes it's this text, but you see that <laughs> ebb and flow all over the place. This is one of the expansions. This is not universal. Some people would tell you this is all craziness, and other people would tell you they can't imagine having a Seder without it. These are some of the different things that people have added over the years. Some of these I didn't even know until I started preparing for this. Okay? The bread crust was one of them that was introduced. And in the pack, there's a whole, there's, there's links, and then there's also a um, little bit deeper discussion of this. Apparently, bread crusts came from uh, the 1970s, I'd like to say, um, and it was a response to um, LGBTQ presence um, saying that, um, that uh, somebody said that gay people don't belong in Judaism like a bread crust doesn't belong in a Seder plate. And so people put the bread crust on the Seder plate saying that everybody belongs. Okay? You'll see it here a similar story with the orange. And I've heard the orange be LGBTQ and, um, and women. That women don't belong in the bima like an orange belongs in, on, on a Seder plate. So people started putting an orange on the Seder plate. Um, Fair trade chocolate coffee and, um, and coffee are cocoa beans, okay? Um, and the U Emerson Center, Unitarian Fellowship, has an amazing fair trade market that they have in their building. Um, if Passover is all about freeing people from slavery and bondage, then that's a way of, by putting fair trade chocolate or coffee on your Seder plate is saying we realize that there is a lot of the coffee and chocolate that gets consumed in a world that is dependent on child labor and on slave labor. And this is a way of pushing back. And if we're talking about that in our Seder, let's represent it on our Seder plate. The banana um, came from a story of Syrian refugees that a rabbi or somebody had witnessed um, uh, some children in Syria that were refugees. Like our ancestors who were strangers in the land of Egypt, we were on the run, we were slaves, and then we were refugees running for it. And these refugees, they, the person saw the father every day bring them a banana. And so as a way of remembering that we have to reach out and welcome the stranger into our midst. Look at the, look the banana. banana. <laughs> okay? Um, cashews. There was a rabbi preparing for Passover. He saw somebody saying, we're trying to send cashews to the troops in Afghanistan. And so that found its way onto the Seder plate as a way of saying that we are responsible for people that aren't able to be home and are out doing protecting our country. We have our responsibility to take care of them. Um, now I'm even forgetting the potato. What was the potato? Bueller. Ah, Ethiopian Jews. When the Jews from Ethiopia came um, to Israel, their um, digestive tracts were shut down, and a lot of them were fed potato and potatoes and rice as a way of being able to be able to, to sustain themselves after that passage. So the potato is a reminder of how do we take care of um, the Ethiopian Jews of Israel. Um, olives. An olive branch is a symbol of peace, and so we put an olive on our Seder plate as a way of hoping for peace in the world. <laughs> um, artichokes. Um, were about interfaith. Um, the tomato was for farm workers. Um, the flowers and seeds were for sustainability. And then the final one that I happened to find was acorns to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of, this is, a, my, my family came here as immigrants from Europe. There were other people that were on this land. People might put an acorn to acknowledge that there were other people that had been living here for thousands of years before Amer immigrants came, European immigrants came to this land, okay? I show these not because I use any of them or all of them. I show you because that's part of the beauty of the Seder, that it's not a fixed, look, I've got one, two, three, four, five, and that is like a fraction of the different, different Haggadot that I have on my shelf. It is a beautiful, flexible, I said, preserve and evolve. You have the basic ritual, and people are really wrestle with, struggle with, what does it mean to symbolize these values and tell these stories and live the values out? How can I talk about slavery and freedom for my people, my ancient ancestors, 
4,000 years ago and not look around and see injustice in the world that I'm supposed to stand up for. And that's where you see some of, where you see these symbols. And some people swear by them and some people swear at them. <laughs> um, but I wanted you to see that that's kind of, a, it's an incredible response of Passover. Um, here's the last one. Um, and this one is, I, I took a little bit of time to really wrap my mind around what this is. Um, this is from a scholar by the name of Michael Twitty. Michael Twitty just wrote a book called The Cooking Gene. And um, he is black, he's gay, and he's Jewish. Okay? Um, I will be in love. A, what was that? I think I said oh, all of the above. I think I said all of the above. <laughs> He's all of the above. Michael Twitty is a food demonstrator and historian. And what he does is um, he goes and he uses 17th, 18th, and 19th century cooking technology. Um, and it's in the last page of the packet has the description of all of that stuff. Um, to show what people would have been using to make food 200 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, focusing very much for himself on what the um, African slaves um, or the new, even newly free would have been using in order to be able to eat. At some point, he did a demonstration for a Sephardic synagogue in the, the D.C. area. And what struck him was that Judaism uses food to tap into memory. That's what I've been teaching tonight. All of these ways that our food tells a story and helps us remember who we were. We were slaves in the, uh, Egypt. God brought plagues and God brought signs and portents and led the people of Israel to freedom and redemption. That's what all of this stuff is all about. It was a hard and painful experience, but we also have had a taste of sweetness. He was very struck by the way that Judaism uses food as an incredible tool to unlock identity and memory. And he said, if, if and he and ends up converting to Judaism, and he starts using and applying this sort of stuff to how does he figure out where his family came from and who he is. And that's really what's in his book, The Cooking Gene. Um, what you see before you is something from his web, web page, Afro Culinaria, and he says, would the African-American Seder plate for Passover be? Okay? Now, this is a really interesting construction, and I was trying to really wrap my head around it before I even go through the layers of what's on it. Because there's also something very challenging about Passover. Um, the story of Jesus and Easter is very close to Passover, and there are a lot of linkages between Passover and, Je and, the, and the death of Jesus. Um, and there's even arguments to be made that Jesus is, is, well, it's not even an argument. Jesus is in Jerusalem at the time of Passover. I have seen churches do Passover seders. That, to me, becomes problematic because this stuff that I'm talking about of the Passover seder we do didn't come around until long after Jesus. Right? Because I'm talking, this stuff is Mishnah. There are parts of it that are coming from before, but what we do with four cups of wine, what we do with the Seder plate and the matzah, all of that is comes to, into Judaism after. The Seder is my way of telling the Passover Seder, sorry, the Passover story and the exodus from Egypt is part of my Jewish identity. It starts to get to... Um, um, what do you call it, to um, when you're taking somebody else's um, appropriation. It starts to become appropriation when I see stuff that never belonged to Christianity being taken because you're trying to get closer to Jesus. I'm not for, I, I have no issue with trying to understand the story of Jesus for a Christian person. That's part of the religion. But there has been a lot of historic um, action by the Christian church to diminish and destroy Judaism over time. And that 
whole taking, uh, doing Passover Seder starts to rub into that. And so I am very hesitant with that. Um, I will go and teach about Passover and this stuff to um, Christian communities, and I will even explain that. Um, but it, and listen, I was even hearing, uh, there was a, a episode of the Sports Bowl, which is an absolutely beautiful podcast. You have half an hour, the Sports Bowl with Dan Cashman. Um, he, he just does a marvelous job talking about food and culture and human beings. And he had a group of people from all different religions and all different cultures, and they were young and hip, and they said, we're going to do a Passover Seder because we hear it's really symbolic. That even, Jill, my wife and I, Jill and I, had a whole crazy conversation of whether they could do that or not. At what point does it start to diminish our Jewish practice of a Seder or not? We had a whole discussion and debate over it because it's not necessarily clear cut. No one wants to say, that's mine, you can't do it, <laughs> right? But at the same time, at what point do you start to do a per where it becomes appropriation where it becomes really problematic? This isn't that, I think. And this is, again, trying to wrap my mind around that. This is the African-American Seder plate for Passover. This is by a Jewish man trying to not do a Passover Seder, but use the symbols of Passover to understand the experience of Africans that were brought to this country against their will. It's a strange intersectionality. I'm not sure I love it, and yet it's still really pretty amazing to look at and to consider. What is his list? His list is, I'm sorry, I can't read it from over there, um, that instead of matzah, you would have a hoe cake or an ash cake, which were like, those were the matzah, right? That was the sign of that's all they had to make a carb. A chicken bone, because they didn't have beef and they didn't have pork. They were lucky to have even a chicken bone. Um, the orange, I can't even, modern symbol of, I can't read that. He talks about the corrosive, you have a hot pepper. Instead of sweet greens, what do they have? Collard greens, you have the sweet potato, the egg. You can see um, where he's trying to take the different symbols of the Seder plate, connect them to African-American food experiences, and then African-American life experiences. It's in that weird place. There was there a question? Yep, go ahead, Sandberg. There's a good reason that the churches do that because some of the churches think that they've replaced the Jews as the chosen people. The Bible doesn't teach that anyway. And so it's good that the churches have the Seder to understand that they aren't the chosen people. You know, it's to the advantage of the Jews, and it awakens some of the Christians. There's a lot of discussion that goes with that. Um, I even say it as uh, that's a place that a lot of dialogue needs to happen. Um, and I'd rather, you know, I would rather see people come to Jew, non-Jews come to Jewish seders to see us as we're telling our story. But even that can get problematic of, I'm going to come, oh, I want to watch you do your thing, which that gets to be a little, sometimes a little creepy too. Um, there, there's a lot of dialogue that can happen with that. Um, so I saw this, and this, that was actually part of the impetus um, for teaching this, the this, this Seder plate, because here's an incredible example um, from a different cultural reference point and a different life experience, certainly from mine. Of here's somebody else and taking these symbols and interpreting them to tell their story of what their struggle was. Um, so, uh, and aha, what is that? That is the end of the, of the uh, PowerPoint, which means if are there are any questions. Well, thank you very much. Was that thank you very much? That was, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Linda. I think that was Linda. If I may, a very, very quick question, which you have probably answered at the first uh, session and answered now. Is there, 
one specific place in the Torah that tells us how we should be celebrating Passover. Because our religion of Judaism is like every other religion in the world. And it's, it's a matter of what's available. It's a matter where what part of the world you come from. Everything has changed. And there, is, there are sects of Judaism who don't believe anything that we do now in modern days. But what in the Torah tells us exactly what we should be doing? So the answer to that, Myra, is no. There is not one place. Not one thing. Three or four different places with all kinds of different layers. So you have the, what they did when they came out of Egypt, and then you have what they did while they're in the wilderness, and then you have and what it, they, did, they were getting ready to go into the land. So and it's, it's, and at Africa and the whole, everything is, I hate to use the expression of mishmash, but this sect of Jews doesn't believe this because they're practicing this. And instead of respecting what Judaism, Judaism is all about, and it's, it's being able to survive wherever we are, whatever, wherever we're coming from. Yes. I mean, that's the simple thing, and that's one of the things I've always talked about, is, um, is ha you, we have two choices, right? You can either take your holy book and look at somebody and tell them they're doing it wrong, and so you whack them over the head, your, the head with their, your holy book, or you can say, this is my holy book, and that's your holy book, and you're going to do yours, and I'm going to do mine. We can learn from watching each other, but it's okay if you have your holy book. And I have your holy book. <laughs> Whacking each other over the head just proves who's right over oh. which holy book ends up diminishing the holy book. Yeah. I think that's what Judaism is all about. <laughs> and, Picking and, and choosing it. What the rabbis are wrestling with is, in Torah even, there are, also, there are different places that describe different layers and elements and threads Get yeah. Okay. With the yeah. Okay. Yes, Quick question, Rabbi. Right. Yes. Um, I mean, the story of Passover is a uh, uh, being slaves in the land of um, Egypt, yes, and, yes. and and there was something that I had a little discussion with somebody that was saying how slavery had existed for you know from ancient times that there was slavery in Egypt and I said yeah that's the Passover story and so something was said about so were were Jews the ones that uh, I guess we don't truly truly know but were they the ones that were the Jews the ones that built the pyramids no my understanding of the timing is that Pyramids, I believe, are much older than the Israelites coming out. Um, they okay. The descriptions we have is they were building cities, um, but not. I believe the pyramids are actually even older. Okay. Yeah. Other mm -hmm. questions. Next week is the pomegranate. Oh, <laughs> your favorite. <laughs> <laughs> we will be looking at all things pomegranate. Look up pictures of pomegranates. We have a we do have a problem. However, it is not pomegranate season. So I can't bring you a pomegranate. I do have a good supply of pomegranate puckers. There you go. <laughs> really so I have pomegranate candy. Um, but next week we will be discussing the power of the pomegranate. Yay! And if there are no other questions. And we will go ahead and close out tonight. And I will say thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, thank thank you Rabbi. You, Rabbi. Yes, thank you. And thank I you. do want some of your sourdough starter. Okay. <laughs> I have some of those that I can share. Um, and if, other, if you have questions, if you look through the, the handout, and the handout is most of the stuff that was on the PowerPoint, and you find you have questions during the week, just send me an email, give me a call. Happy to, to, to answer those kinds of questions. I am taking the recording and putting it up on the Temple Beth Shalom of Vero Beach um, YouTube channel. And so if there's somebody that is that you want that wants to see it, it it's up there and available. Okay. So, I'm just it's fun. Back here to turn it on. <laughs> stop the recording. It's wonderful seeing all of you. Yes. I wanted to <laughs> say bye, bye everybody. Bye. Good night.
Bye, yeah. Ellen. Bye, Nancy. Bye. 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 Bye